or some kind of rules. After all, within societies, we have rules by which all of us uh, function. So in a, its natural global society will also require rules and institutions and regimes and mechanisms. Now, I, I can understand some of the dissatisfaction with the way multilateralism is functioning. Okay, we have our own uh, complaints. I mean, we look at the United Nations today and see a body which was invented in 1944-45, uh, where, uh, you know, the entire continent of Africa, the entire continent of Latin America, uh, the second most populous country in the world are all outside the key decision-making body. But this satisfaction, as I said, should not uh, should lead us to think of ways of fixing the problem rather than walking away from the problem. Uh, and uh, I mean, we would uh, certainly hope that uh, uh, if you have an administration in Washington, which is uh, more in line with what I'm saying, uh, that the possibility of all of us uh, sitting around the table and finding a fix. And I, and, and I realize the importance of that fix, you know, we, we will be entering the Security Council on the 1st of January. And we are entering the council on the platform of reformed multilateralism. You know, I've spoken to a number of foreign ministers in Africa, in the Caribbean, in Latin America. And I say, look, we will be entering, but we will be entering for you also. That we know today that there are voices out there which are, which are missing. Uh, so, uh, I, I would certainly hope that uh, we, we uh, take multilateralism because, you know, uh, the absence of multilateralism or a weakened multilateralism, I think we have seen the, the downside of that in the last few years. Uh, and, and that is something which, uh, well, you know, none of us wants a gridlock WTO. You know, uh, we don't want a UN which is sidelined in the most important crisis of our lives, we, you know, which is really what we have seen uh, this year. So, so we, we would uh, hope, I mean, I certainly hope that the next Rizina, uh, whose dates have not yet been decided, we actually sit and look back at the last five years and say, okay, what are the lessons we learned and what should we be doing now? So you expect from the new administration in the United States a different attitude, but if I look back to your country, your prime minister had a special relationship with the current president of the United States. You expect a different attitude towards the future, also towards India? Well, look, you know, where India-US relations are concerned, we've been uh, on an upward kind of uh, trajectory, uh, frankly, for more than 20 years. Uh, I would say uh, the, the transformation in India-US relations started with Bill Clinton. Uh, it, George W. Bush took it to a higher level. It was solidified by Barack Obama and we got along well with Trump. You know, frankly, it's in our national interest to get along with the president of the day in the United States. It, it is, uh, it's to me a, a perfectly a normal and uh, obvious thing uh, to do in diplomacy. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, uh, President-elect Biden uh, is someone we know. We knew him well as vice president. He had come to India as vice president. Many of us who've done the U.S. account know him from his senatorial days. He was, uh, you know, he was extremely helpful to us on a very, very transformational initiative uh, dealing with India uh, on the nuclear deal when he was uh, uh, the minority ranking minority member and chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. We know many members of the uh, circle around him. It's obviously not clear who will occupy office and who will not. Uh, but we have uh, every confidence that uh, uh, what we have seen over the last four administrations will continue to the fifth. And this is not guesswork. I mean, yesterday night, Mr. Biden and Prime Minister Modi had a long telephone call. Uh, it was a very warm telephone call. It was a very good telephone call. They discussed the corona situation. Uh, they discussed the climate change issue. They discussed what was happening in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so, so there is a very sort of solid reason why I am uh, uh, saying what I am to you. 
Good. So we turn to the EU. Um, we also have seen, or I would say that there is a renewed strength of the dialogue between the EU and India. And we had this important summit on the, in July and, and the statements which came out of the summit. Of course, already before that, there was kind of several groups in the EU which were pushing for a uh, more intense relationship, which I also heard when I went to the Resina dialogues in uh, New Delhi. Um, what do you expect now, well, let's say, to come? We see that there was a, a very important element, which is core part of your mandate, focused on security and defense and on the cooperation between the EU and India on security and defense. And we have, for example, in the EU delegation in uh, New Delhi, a security and defense representative as well? Well, uh, you know, I uh, would like you to take this remark in the positive uh, spirit in which it is intended. Uh, my sense is that uh, for a certain period, uh, because the EU was very preoccupied with its own internal uh, problems, uh, uh, the, the priorities and the focus of the EU was in itself and immediately around it. Now, the EU is a global player. Okay, I mean, uh, if, you, if you look at the, uh, you know, by any yardstick uh, of, of uh, uh, sort of, uh, I would say, uh, strength or power, I mean, the EU is right up there. Now, if the EU doesn't take enough interest uh, in Asia, uh, or if it looks at Asia with a relatively narrow focus, if it looks at Asia uh, primarily economically and say, well, it's all about trade or it's all about investment, uh, then I think the EU is not serving its own uh, long-term interests well, because uh, the fact is economic uh, issues are significantly affected by non-economic factors. You know, uh, the, the politics uh, of a particular region, security issues. I mean, if you see today, you can't stay away from connectivity debates, from technology debates, from data debates. All these are part of, of what is going to make our future work. So uh, my sense very honestly was that there was a period where uh, the EU, uh, I would say, uh, didn't have the kind of focus and attention uh, which, uh, you know, a body as powerful and significant as you should have had. But I do think that I see in the last year, year and a half, uh, much more of that, you know. Uh, I've, I've seen, for example, uh, uh, Indo-Pacific policy from, I mean, first of all, I saw an EU-India policy, which I welcomed very much. Uh, then I've seen an Indo-Pacific policy on the part of countries like Germany and, uh, and uh, France. Uh, there is, I know, a lot of other debates going on. And in our own, in our own interaction, I mean, uh, you know, uh, we, we've been engaging the uh, Nordic group, we've been engaging the Nordic Baltic group, we've been talking to the Visegrad group. Uh, I was there uh, with the, for the Mediterranean dialogue, uh, you know, again, for, with Portugal, uh, we have a very, very uh, strong uh, dialogue today uh, going on. And uh, we would like to see a strategic EU and a strategic EU which has a Asia strategy, which has a world strategy. I think that's good for the world. I think it's good for India. And I certainly hope that's the direction all of you are going. I think if I were to respond, I think we as Europeans would also like to see a strategic EU, but uh, we often miss it or we know, let's say that... Uh, or member states do not manage to find a coherent view to have a strategic EU. But at least on one thing, we see that there is no progress. The FTA has been put back on the agenda. We know this discussions about the trade relationship between the EU and India has been ongoing for quite some time, I think more than 20 years. Um, and then it broke down somewhere earlier, uh, I mean, five, seven, eight years ago. Um, we now see it but back on the agenda. What do you expect also in the context of this, I mean, focus of the EU now on sustainability, on, on environmental issues, on the social issues, so, yeah, also other many things. What do you expect now to happen? Let's say, will we make progress in an FTA between the EU and India? Or will the EU put the conditions far too high for you? Well, uh, 
let me, you know, first of all, let me be clear. I'm the foreign minister. I'm not the trade minister. So there are some things I know. There are many things I don't know. And there are many, and I generally don't comment about things I don't know. Uh, so uh, I think where the FTA is concerned, uh, yes, there were negotiations. My recollection was till 2013. Uh, uh, this was not our government. It was the government before us. Uh, but whatever it was, it was India. And it didn't work out. Uh, uh, but uh, after our government came to power, uh, we have uh, spoken repeatedly about the need to resume negotiations. I think uh, in the last uh, five years, the EU very frankly was uh, preoccupied with many of the other negotiations which it had already uh, entered into, which were much more advanced. Uh, when I was in Brussels last, which was in March, right? Uh, in March, uh, I actually spoke at that time to Commissioner Hogan. Uh, and uh, uh, I said, look, I was conveying from my trade minister uh, interest in resuming uh, negotiations. Uh, we want a fair and balanced uh, FTA, but of course, obviously what is fair and balanced itself is the subject of negotiation. Uh, I recognize that uh, an FTA with Europe uh, is, a, is not an easy negotiation, probably maybe in the to, you know, in the world, it must be the most difficult negotiation because it's a very high standard uh, FTA. So uh, we are not uh, uh, unaware of that. Uh, my sense is a lot of the conversations are still going around, uh, uh, you know, do we resume? When do we resume? On what terms do we resume? You know, there's been in between an interest uh, saying, uh, can we separate the investment side of it? Can we do a separate agreement on investment? Should that be the priority? There was European interest uh, in that. On our side, there was some whether, you know, can we do a kind of a early harvest, a kind of a sectoral agreement? So I think there are conversations going on. Uh, I, I would certainly say as foreign minister, I would uh, definitely like to see a fair and balanced uh, FTA with uh, Europe. Uh, because, you know, when I look at the world, uh, you know, you spoke of multipolarity. Uh, there is political multipolarity, but there is economic multipolarity as well. And that changes for different countries. I have actually, when I look at my uh, trade accounts, uh, my economic accounts, I actually have five big accounts, uh, which is uh, the United States, uh, EU, uh, China, uh, ASEAN, and the Gulf. Okay. These five are the five economic poles uh, around which uh, much of my trade and my investment uh, is organized. Yeah. And uh, for me to, to get the best out of it, I, you know, in a multipolar world, there's a very simple rule of negotiation, which is if you advance on any account, you advance on all accounts. So you constantly need to keep going forward, 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 because the moment you fall back on an account, you fall back on all accounts. Uh, so I would like to see uh, on the economic side uh, certainly progress, and I know my trade minister would as well. But the negotiation is for him and his counterpart to do. And then as we're speaking about trade, there was an important announcement this week. The RISIP, which was uh, concluded between a group of Asian countries, and the comment in Europe was rapidly, you see the gravity of the world is moving towards Asia. But then I think uh, people in Europe were a bit surprised. India is not part of it, but apparently India is considering that. You know, uh, uh, we actually uh, indicated that about a year ago uh, at the last East Asia summit uh, in Bangkok. Uh, we were part of the negotiations. The negotiations were, were going on for, for many years. Uh, but uh, uh, we reached a point because, you know, finally it came to a decision point. Uh, and essentially we saw that a number of our key concerns were not addressed. Uh, and we had to then uh, take a call whether do you enter a trade agreement uh, uh, if your major concerns are not addressed or do you take a call saying, well, I, I, I don't think this is in my uh, interest. Uh, and uh, we took a call that uh, given the way it is uh, currently, 
that it is not in our interest yeah. uh, to to uh, enter this agreement because it would have uh, fairly immediate uh, negative uh, consequences for our uh, own economy i i think you know this is part of any negotiation because you are negotiating doesn't mean that you have to uh, suspend your ability to calculate at the end of the negotiation so i think we made those calculation i mean very frankly uh, to me what we did on with regard to rcep is not a generic position vis-a-vis -vis trade i mean i i uh, it's like saying if i went to a shop and i didn't buy that product i don't like markets in general no i went to that shop i didn't like that product mm. okay but if you give me a better product in europe i'd be very happy to look at it probably final comment before i uh, break it open to let's say the other panelists anything you want to say on our current health crisis on the cooperation between the eu and india on health related matters i mean there's been a lot in the media about this also on the dependence of europe on medicines which are produced in india i mean how do you see this cooperation in this crisis context <laughs> uh, okay uh, for, uh, first of all yes uh, we we do supply medicines to the world generally uh, and in the during the covid period uh, there was a particular demand for two medicines uh, one was for hydroxychloroquine uh, and one was for paracetamol uh, and uh, in you know in our case uh, uh, part of the problem is that the api uh, for these medicines is not made in india uh, they come from china so we are like the the people who take the api and make that into into medicines with dosages that you consume so uh, we went out of our way to actually ask our pharmaceutical companies to ramp up the production uh, to uh, in in uh, you know i i can uh, there were particular countries at that time you know particularly the countries which were initially very deeply affected like uh, italy and spain uh, they in some cases people asked us for the api uh, now uh, which went really we gave them the api which we had bought from china uh, at a time when our own supplies from china were were not uh, uh, smooth uh, because you know logistics were interrupted uh, but we tried very very hard to accommodate as many international requests uh, as possible uh, in fact uh, uh, we supplied 150 mm. countries with medicines uh, of which about 85 countries which were uh, smaller countries in the caricom in the pacific islands in africa uh, who didn't have uh, access to these medicines in many cases we flew them at our own cost uh, we we supplied 85 countries with uh, uh, free packages of uh, uh, paracetamol and hydroxychloroquine and a whole lot of other medicines, antibiotics and so on, uh, which were uh, relevant for treatment. Because we take our responsibility of being the pharmacy to the world very seriously. Now, today, the focus has shifted to vaccines. Uh, there are three major clinical tri uh, trials going on in India. Uh, one uh, which involves the AstraZeneca uh, uh, vaccine uh, is in stage three. Uh, there is a second one, which is Indian, which has just entered stage three. Uh, there's a third one, which is at advanced stage two. Uh, and we believe that, uh, you know, we are part of the COVAX uh, uh, initiative. In fact, we are part of pretty much any international initiative dealing with vaccines. Uh, and my prime minister has said that we will do whatever we have to do to make sure that vaccines are made affordable and accessible uh, to the entire world. Uh, we have shown that when it came to hydroxychloroquine and paracetamol. Uh, so we certainly intend to step up to that. Uh, when, when Corona started, you know, we made no PPEs. Uh, we had no testing production in India. Uh, we had very little mask uh, production. Uh, so uh, we had no ventilator production. Now, uh, today we are meeting our own requirements 
and our requirements are big because purely in numbers, after the United States, we have the largest number of affected people. Uh, but uh, we are actually supplying uh, abroad uh, as well. So we've, uh, the, the whole industry that we've actually created uh, this year. Uh, and uh, in terms of what is happening in India, uh, you know, uh, our numbers, I, I think the general sense is that we are past the peak. Uh, there were, you know, our peak was more than 90,000 uh, new patients every day. Okay. Yeah. We are down to about 30, 35,000 right now. Uh, but Corona has been a challenge, you know, we've had second waves. Uh, in some places, we've even had a third wave. Uh, so uh, we are not complacent. We know that, you know, this is something we'll have to work its way through. Even vaccines are not a silver bullet, which will come and, you know, yeah. uh, automatically uh, next day, everything would be okay. So we are very, very uh, sort of uh, practical about it. But uh, our sense is that uh, the by by uh, you know by prime minister himself going out there telling people to take it seriously you know uh, encouraging people to uh, observe social distancing wearing masks i mean you saw me i came in with a mask i only removed it because i'm talking to you uh, yeah. but uh, my sense is that look we have done we, we could have been in a much much worse situation yeah. And and we have managed that. And uh, where the economy is concerned, also uh, our census the last two months, September and October, uh, there's a very very strong uh, return to normalcy. Uh, in fact, we have done better September October than we did last year. Uh, so we are hopeful for a very very rapid economic recovery. Wow, oh, very good to hear. Um... Also impressed to hear that world, word pharmacy of the world. I haven't heard that before here. Of course, I knew about this production capacity in India, but I wasn't aware about that word. That's, that's great to hear. We turn to Anna Zakarias, who's state secretary in the Portuguese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but also busily preparing, as you may know, the Portuguese presidency of the uh, Council of the European Union and uh, on which India will have a big focus. And I would like to add, let's say, that there will be the beginning of kind of a more interactive part of this, that we can also, to the participants, you can also ask questions on the Q&A box at the bottom, and I will try to take some questions at the end. But I turn to Anna first. Who, how do you see the relationship with uh, India, and how important will it be for your presidency? Thank you, Carol. Greetings, Minister. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, greetings also to uh, our MEP, uh, Soren Garde, for, and thank you for this opportunity to participate in this, uh, in this debate. And I've listened very carefully to the conversation you had with the Minister. And really, in the midst of this pandemic, in the situation where the world is today, the words of the Minister uh, have only reinforced the reasons why Portugal uh, chose uh, to put the relations between uh, India and the European Union at the top of the priorities of our external agenda uh, as soon as we start the uh, presidency of the Council of the European Union on, on the 1st of uh, January. Um, and uh, following the successful EU-India summit last July, we really would like to organize an informal meeting of the leaders of the European Union with uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, around the months of May. And uh, it is indeed uh, what, what the minister said, uh, it's, it's really put us on the same line, this idea uh, that both the European Union and India need to have this more strategic approach uh, as they are fundamental deliverers of uh, um, international public goods. And when we talk about this, we talk about first values, democracy, uh, rule of law, fundamental values. Uh, being the largest democracies in the world, we need to be guarantors of democracy. Uh, it's, it's a very big thing at this moment. Um, the second thing, as the minister said, is multilateralism. The idea that when we start our presidency of the uh, um, European Union Council, um, India will, uh, will start uh, their presidency uh, or their participation in the UN Security Council. Um, so a rules-based multilateral order, uh, as the minister put it uh, so well, uh, this uh, possibility of 
seeking to improve rather than walk back from what we've created as a rules-based order is fundamental. It's the UN, it's WTO, it's the World Health Organization uh, where we need to work. So we look also forward for the presidency of India of the G20. Uh, this is also a very uh, relevant uh, um, moment for India. Um, and the third aspect, so it's democracy, it's, uh, uh, it's multilateralism, is also uh, economic growth and development. And here uh, I, I uh, reckon the words of the minister saying that we need to push forward this economic relation. Uh, let's see, it's not easy. Uh, we've been discussing the uh, uh, FTA, uh, that's fair, that's balanced. We would like uh, to start maybe by an agreement on investment protection. Uh, we discussed this with the Indian authorities. The idea of the, the EU is the... Um, uh, foreign direct investment stock in India amounts like to 68 billion euros amounted in, in 2018. Uh, and, but this is uh, significant, but it's uh, significantly below China and Brazil, for instance. So we need, we could do more uh, here in the protection of, uh, of investment and pushing. Um, there are already more than 6,000 uh, 6, uh, uh, European companies present in India. Uh, it could improve. So this, this is an area uh, that is very relevant and, uh, and it's very relevant also in other areas that the minister mentioned uh, in the digital domain. Digital area is also fundamental for the world today. And here um, we, uh, we welcome this EU India roadmap for 2050 where digital uh, question on infrastructures, on uh, the data economy um, are, are fundamental elements and uh, last but not least, this idea of uh, democracy in the digital world, access to uh, the rights uh, of the people into uh, the digital world. I think this is also very important. So uh, eager to continue this uh, debate uh, with the minister and, uh, and also to improve and uh, focus uh, one of the principal elements of our relation between, uh, uh, in terms of external relations between the European Union and, and India. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Minister, you want to comment on this now or shall I first give the floor to Søren? Uh, no, I, I think I'll comment on it later. Why don't uh, I listen to... So Søren is, uh, as I mentioned already, a chair of the EU India Committee and European Parliament, member of the European Parliament from uh, Denmark. Also, Denmark has a special relationship with India. I don't know for what reason, probably, sir, and you could explain because I saw that uh, Prime Minister Modi had a conversation with the Prime Minister of uh, Denmark at some stage. So, a small, yes. tiny country, at least uh, from a global perspective, uh, has a special relationship with India, sir. Yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, uh, we have had our issues in the past, but I think we have what we can call a very close and uh, tight relationship with uh, India right now. And thank you very much, Your Excellency, for being our keynote speaker today. Of course, one of the things I know that uh, your Prime Minister and uh, the Prime Minister of Denmark have talked about is uh, the Green Deal and, and how to to help um, uh, India in uh, specific ways. Uh, trying not to make the same mistakes as we did when we um, we tried to uh, to enhance the the livelihood for uh, for our citizens and i know that uh, uh, clean water is a big issue in india and uh, that is also what i'm going to to stress is that after the the summit uh, the summit that was held in in july this year uh, of course there's a lot of uh, work in front of us, especially in the European Parliament, because we must say that even though some countries uh, in Europe have good bilateral um, relationships with India, I must say, uh, being a chair of the uh, Indian EU um, the delegation, um, a lot can be uh, done in a better way. And I think one of the big issues in front of us will be to transform the jointly agreed statement and roadmap into action and to retain the commitment to annual uh, summits. And of course, um, there's also this uh, about uh, re-establishing our inter-parliamentary and uh, contact in 2021, uh, when the current health situations actually allowed us to uh, to doing so. so. So I really do think there is um, uh, uh, the the future is bright if we really want it and uh, make a difference. 
I also uh, look into the figures that has been mentioned um, before in this conversation. I mean, we have trade with uh, with China six, seven times bigger than with India. And, and for what reason? I mean, we could do better with India if you look into, you know, how governments, how MEPs, how we look into India. It's always with a, a positive view. And I don't, I don't think we have... Um, we have used uh, uh, this um, to make the relationship between the European Union and India stronger. And I will do my utmost to, uh, to do so in the years to come, being chair of this uh, delegation and uh, rest assured that I will try to uh, do what I can to make the declaration of the uh, summit held in, in July to, to make that uh, happen. I think I will start with these words. I mean, can I ask a follow-up question, sir? Yeah. I mean, the parliament plays a very important role in trade agreements, and your yeah. country will put a, put a lot of influence, emphasis, as you said, on environmental and social issues. But we know that there's, these were stumbling blocks in the past in negotiations with um, India. How do you see this? Meaning, will you try to push, um, try to eventually accommodate some of India's wishes to try to get an agreement on a trade pact? For, for sure, and for many reasons. I mean, we have in uh, in the European Parliament, we have this Green Deal, and we are realizing that, you know, it's important to do something to save the world, so to speak. And we also know that we cannot do it on our own. And uh, <laughs> India, the, the biggest democracy in the world, and some of our friends, I mean, we should, uh, we should uh, as friends, we should try to help India to achieve their goals with uh, you know carbon footprint as small as possible, and of course we have something to offer. So it, it's also you know to to uh, to show our friendship, but also to do business. And we have a lot of companies. I mean, they will uh, be pleased to do businesses with uh, India, but they will also be uh, a benefit for uh, for the population of India because we have uh, something to offer. Uh, you know, in the green sector, so to speak. And I know that it is also on the agenda in India, how to achieve some of those um, uh, green, uh, how, how to, to achieve the goals and uh, to save the world. And, and of course, it sounds very strange, save the world, but we have something to offer. And I think that could be, that could be a way to, to start because a lot of MIPs, they are really, really into this business. And when hopefully we are going to visit India, this could be on the, on the agenda, of course, also other issues, but as His Excellency rightly said, I mean, if we talk about defense, this is not our, was, we don't have a lot to offer there from the European Union, but I think we have a lot to offer uh, as uh, friends and uh, being a democracy, shared values, and of course, also on, uh, on, uh, on trade uh, issues. So I'm looking forward to, um, to, to have those uh, talks uh, also when we meet, hopefully Your Excellency, uh, person to person in in uh, Delhi on a on a later occasion. Thank you, sir. Minister. We go back to you. You see a very receptive for a very open attitude towards more cooperation with uh, India. So a lot of hopes, let's say, that it can be done. And uh, as well from the democracy side, what you contribute to the world, what you've contributed, as you said, let's say, in the context of the health crisis, but also much more broadly on the on the trade side. Is um, India ready for this? Well, before I get into that, uh, let me answer your Denmark question. Uh, I believe uh, tomorrow we would be marking 400 years of the establishment of a Danish trading post uh, in a place called Trankebar uh, in, in South Ooh. India, which is very close to where I, my family comes from. So uh, we go back 400 years, so you understand why we are so familiar with each other. Of course, we go back even old, longer with Portugal. Uh, so so uh, that's also something uh, I, I will say. Uh, you know, I, I picked up three or four important points which uh, you both made in your comments. And I think uh, I, want to, I want to speak a little bit about it because to my mind, that is actually central to our relationship uh, today. The first was the digital point. Uh, which uh, uh, Minister Zakarias made. You know, if there is, we, uh, uh, when, when Prime Minister Modi came to power, he 
started a campaign of what he called Digital India, okay? And for us, digitization has been a phenomenal sort of, uh, I would say, uh, it's, it's a game changer in a way, you know? It's such an innovative, uh, flexible, multifaceted tool. And I, I'd give you examples of that. Uh, you know, when, when uh, COVID happened, all of us uh, downloaded an app, okay? And the app basically asked you questions about who you had met, who had uh, shown some, you know, who had traveled recently, come back, showed symptoms, not feeling well, et cetera. The result was uh, we create, and this was volunteer, okay? So we downloaded it. Uh, so, and then you would uh, actually, it was enormously helpful for us in contact tracing. Uh, we had a lot of people who lost their jobs. Uh, in many cases, people from villages who were working in cities. So we then took two major policy decisions, which was we decided to put money in the bank accounts of people, okay, uh, directly. Now we could do that because we had done the prior digital preparation by having bank accounts, which they had opened up and they were digitally linked. And uh, in fact, uh, this was before the COVID, uh, we had got four, more than 400 million bank accounts opened up of people, okay? So you had a very smooth transfer of money to people when they really, really needed it. Similarly, till November, we were giving uh, free food uh, to, to families who, who were in that, okay? Uh, and uh, this was, uh, if you looked at the total number of people covered by it, it was almost 800 million people, okay? Now, again, you could make sure that the right person got it because there was a digital uh, connect. And the fact that all of us today have a unique identity number, uh, a biometric identity number uh, has made us actually a very, very rapidly growing uh, digital society. So uh, we have huge interest today. I mean, well, you know, well, what is our challenge? Our challenge is how do you catch up with the rest of the world, okay? And digital will allow us to catch up faster uh, because you don't have to go through all the steps you would do uh, otherwise. Now, we watch a lot of things in Europe because we realize that with every digital gain, there is also a risk, uh, you know, uh, cyber security, data security, data privacy. We watch your debates. We watch your, read your laws. Uh, we look at your practices. There is, there is a lot of learning out there uh, for us. And I believe that the, uh, today the digital uh, sort of, you know, what the digital <coughs> domain offers, uh, even in terms of uh, global talent, I mean, uh, the fact is, you know, when we speak of a knowledge economy, what, do, I mean, everything today, what a car is like an iPad with wheels, okay? So uh, we will, you, you know, be needing a, a human talent to service this digital economy. And that I believe uh, is something which India and EU should be discussing. The second issue is, uh, you know, Denmark and the Green Deal. Uh, but, you know, you also refer to the clean water and, and I want to tell you that again, uh, uh, it's only now that we are having power, electricity for every household. These are all fairly new developments for us. So, but this is today a society which is intensely aspirational. You know, people in India, the people in the countryside are looking at what the cities have, the people in the cities are looking at what the world has. I, I don't think, you know, when you said there will be a gap between EU and India, and of course there will be. Uh, when we negotiate a trade agreement. But we don't want to enter an arrangement saying, oh, we are happy where we are, you are where you are, and how do we bridge the difference? We want to be closer to where you are. I mean, that's our aspiration. Yes. And to do that, we need to work with, you know, uh, for us, Europe is definitely, you know, Europe means resources, Europe means capital, Europe means best exam, best practices, but Europe also means an example. So we would like our interactions to help actually transform our society. And if you, if you look at a lot of other countries, including in Asia, you know, 
We saw Japan changed, Korea changed, China changed, Singapore changed. How did it change? It changed with the benefits of you know, uh, external interactions being, being internalized. So I do believe that there is a big agenda out there. Uh, and for us uh, here, you know, you asked again, I come back to Denmark. You know, we found very fascinating examples of environmental technologies in, in uh, Denmark. You know, we will clean up the country, not if we make it only a, uh, like a social campaign. We also have to make it a successful business. And we see that, you know, I, I, you know there's a lot which, which uh, and, and sometimes the business may be small in your, uh, uh, your uh, uh, country, but it can have a huge application for us. You know, we have a lot of burning of, uh, you know, after harvesting, uh, people burn the, uh, the crop on the field, okay? Which is why the air in Delhi is uh, at this time of the year very bad, okay? Indonesia has the same problem. Now, there is a, there is a technology in, in Denmark, which has the ability to compress this into like a pellet, and then you take it to the power plant and you burn it. So now it, to you, it may be something small. To me, it will actually be the air quality of uh, 15 million people. So there is a lot we have riding on this. And, and you know, we certainly approach today the EU uh, with, a, with a very strong developmental mindset. And we see a lot of possibilities in this partnership. Thank you, Minister. I go back to probably Anna also because there was a question on how during your presidency you would balance the relationship between India with the relationship between the EU and China. And then, which is also related to other questions, to what degree can we use the relationship between <coughs> EU and India towards more trilateral, multilateral relationship in this world? For example, also with Japan. I know there's a special relationship between India and Japan, which I also realized when I was at the Resina dialogue, when you had uh, several times ministers there from Japan participating in the Resina dialogue. I mean, do you have a view, Anna, from your perspective as a country which is also a strong defender of multilateralism, how you will do this during your presidency? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, um, uh, Carol. Um, indeed, we need to look into the uh, Pacific and the Asia Pacific uh, area and to the Indo Pacific uh, domain and, uh, and see what is the best way for the Union to act. I think we have uh, already very clear, uh, defined uh, a set of partners. Uh, indeed, in these last few years, I think we have been a bit slower with this idea of the big partnerships that we had. Uh, there was a moment around uh, 2010, 2011, where we established that we had clearly 10 strategic partners. Then this became a bit more fluid, I would say, uh, in the European Union. And, um, and I think that uh, we need to revisit uh, our relation with Asia. Uh, as a whole, uh, in the positive sense. Uh, we see that the, many say that the, the, there is a shift towards Asia um, of, uh, of the center of the world. Um, I think that uh, uh, in a very uh, multipolar uh, world that we live in, we have to uh, define clearly what we want from uh, uh, our partners and what can be the uh, value added of this relation with each of them. What, what is the purpose of our relation with Japan? What can we learn from each other? How can we work better? What can we do with China? What can we do with India? And do this in a balanced uh, way. Of course, China is uh, a huge partner of the European Union. Um, there are problems also but uh, it's there. And during uh, the Portuguese presidency, probably there will be uh, a couple of meetings, different meetings at sectorial level uh, with, uh, with China. Um, I think uh, Germany during its presidency uh, worked a lot uh, uh, on, on China and uh, there was this uh, summit, unfortunately had to be done by video conference. Um, but it's also, and, and here I would like to add another element. Um, India is also, as the minister uh, was saying before, put an element when he mentioned the, the idea of India uh, place in the UN Security Council as saying, we are here also for others. We are here also um, for Africa. 
And I think this uh, relation uh, between European Union, between the African continent and between India is also a very uh, uh, important element. And, and I know that uh, uh, during its presidency of the G20, India will probably also take into consideration uh, African relations. So uh, we need to see all these elements in an encompassing way. And um, because Africa will also be a very big priority uh, for the European Union and for Portugal, of course. Uh, and now we need to look into Latin America. We we'll need to look into uh, 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 reboosting our transatlantic relation. And, uh, and I think that the European uh, institutions are, uh, are ready uh, for this discussion and for this debate. Thank, Thank you. you, Anna. Søren, if I can follow up on a question with you. I mean, there were some questions from participants related to EU-India relations, which I can <coughs> also ask to the minister, related to, for example, cooperation on migration issues, where the parliament is also active, co cooperation on issues like combating terrorism. Uh, any views on that from the delegation? Have you discussed this? Uh, I know <coughs> this is, an, uh, I mean, a sensitive point also for Europe um, in the cooperation with India. Of course, uh, terrorism is, uh, is very much on the agenda all over the world. Being a former Minister of Defense in Denmark, of course, it has for years been on my agenda. And of course, there's also something we have to offer to each other. I mean, how to, how to fight uh, terrorism around the world, how to stick to our values and still fighting it. And, uh, and of course, uh, that might, this is also something where we, can, uh, we have something to offer to each uh, other. So it's not only about trade, it is about multi-trade, uh, uh, multi uh, being uh, into, you know, how to interact in the world, also security-wise, even though maybe on defense, we don't, do not have a lot to offer. But of course, uh, talking about uh, terrorism and counter-terrorism, of course, this is also an issue that will be on the agenda. And I'm sure that it will be part of the of the talks uh, between the uh, European Union and uh, India in the years to come. Thank you, sir. We go back to the minister. Minister, there were some questions about <coughs> United Nations and how relevant United Nations still is, as you're uh, going to have the uh, membership of the Security Council. But also, when somebody commented, for example, that Macron said the United Nations is no longer relevant today. So we are there, EU. Um, India defenders of multilateralism, but we see that the multilateralist institutions probably need a new, yeah, a new push, a new uh, breadth of, of life. Have you got views on that? And also, if you wanted to comment on the issue of um, migration between EU and India, which is a sensitive issue, I know, and where you're on the demanding side towards the EU. Uh, <clears throat> uh, on the UN issue, look, it goes back to my initial remark. I think the fact that different people from different parts of the world are pointing out to the shortcomings and the relevance of UN is something that the UN should take seriously. You know, I would, uh, it, it's, a, it's common sense after all in our life, you know, what, what is it, look around you, what is it which is 75 years old, which you are still using? <laughs> you know, so every, everything requires, uh, you know, some kind of refreshing, updating, uh, et cetera. And, we can't let the interests of one or two countries which want to freeze one moment of history for their perpetual gain uh, to, to continue. And, and I think the longer we let this uh, uh, stalemate, this gridlock continue, frankly, it's harming the United Nations. I, I don't think the UN is coming out of this. Uh, well, uh, on migration, you know, I do want to say that uh, we, uh, we would uh, look, you know, India is a country which has a lot of people of Indian origin abroad. Okay. Our debates vary, but I think somewhere we are looking at 32, 34 million people. I mean, of course, not all contemporary people, many of them went out 150 years ago, 200 years ago. Uh, but the, the fact is that uh, even in a region like the Gulf today, there are 9 million Indians. Uh, during the uh, corona, you know, the, the uh, lot of people because of corona wanted to come back home. We, we have uh, brought back two and a half million Indians back home from different parts of the world. So uh, we want to make sure that where there is mobility, 
where there is flow of talent, even where there's migration, it should be legal. It should be legal because when it is not legal, the real victims are the people who are on the move. Because everybody from end to end, they exploit them. The, what happens with our partner countries, not all of them fully understand this. You know, to the extent we have mobility and migration agreements, it allows both of us to work out the rules of the game and make sure things, you know, the mobility conforms to that. To the extent we don't have rules of the game, we are actually facilitating, you know, bad practices. Now, uh, certainly with Europe, we would have an interest with different countries in working out mobility and migration agreements. I think we've done that with France uh, and uh, we, would, we have an offer with, with a number of uh, other countries. And we believe it's good for us, but more important, we believe it's good for you. That it's better for you that the people who are coming in, come in through the right channels and the right uh, process. Two very quick observations also, if you'll allow me, one on terrorism, one on Africa. Uh, again, you know, if, if there are three issues in the world today, which we should deal with collectively because there are no national solutions possible, one is climate change, one is pandemics, and one is terrorism. Because in each case, the, you know, a government, a national governments can't say, oh, I don't you know, my air is okay. You don't have a choice on the quality of what's up there. You can't say my health is okay. We discovered that this year because it's going to come from some other country. You can't say I'm okay. The rest of the, my neighbor may have terrorism. It's not my problem. So there are issues uh, and terrorism is one, you know, today pandemics we all know because the COVID has driven it home. Climate change we accept. I think we've got to put terrorism up there with those two issues, because unless we deal with it collectively, we leave pockets, you know, you have a, a somewhere in, you know, in Iraq or in Syria or in Somalia or in Pakistan or in Afghanistan. Uh, these are not problems which will ever remain uh, local. Finally, a quick point on Africa. You know, uh, you, I, there is perhaps not enough awareness in Europe of the strength of India's relations with Africa. Uh, in, uh, in the last few years, our goal was to uh, extend a development uh, assistance to the tune of uh, $10 billion. That was the commitment we made. We are very close to reaching there. We train uh, every year uh, about 10,000 Africans. You know, that's been, in the last uh, five years, we have trained 45,000 uh, Africans. Uh, we have projects in 51 out of 54 African countries. So, and we have a historical connection. I mean, there's no part of Africa where you will not find some Indian doing uh, yeah. business. So it is an area if, if our intention is to uh, strengthen ca capacity building in Africa to, to, you know, fast track development out there to again, help them, you know, do the right things like, We've got a series of solar projects across Africa. We've got a series of digital IT training centers across Africa. So here, I think India and Europe can work together. I think if we, if we harmonize our efforts, I, I think the, we will benefit, the Africans will benefit. Thank you, Minister. Anna, final comment, one minute, and probably also one minute for Sir after that. Your takeaway from this uh, conversation with the minister? Uh, my takeaway is uh, thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you uh, to your excellency minister. And uh, uh, I think we need to continue. This is the, this is the word. We need to continue. India is a very relevant uh, partner for the European Union and for many member states of the, of the European Union individually. Certainly for Portugal it is, uh, for very good reasons and for a long uh, time already. Um, and uh, I do agree that we need to look into where we can have an added value in our cooperation at the world level. So we need to work together at world level to make the difference, uh, be it in climate change, be it in the pandemic, be it in other areas like uh, the, the minister just uh, mentioned, and we need to work together. 
to work together, for instance, in Africa, uh, a continent that is so close to Europe that uh, we really need uh, to work with Africa. And uh, I think uh, we very clearly in our minds, being uh, European Union and India is work with Africa. Uh, so uh, uh, look forward uh, to the continuation of this discussion uh, between the European Union and India uh, in Portugal during our presidency uh, and uh, in the uh, running up to the to the informal summit in May. And uh, I'm sure they uh, we will continue these exchanges. Thank you very very much. Sir, your takeaway. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for. Uh, joining this meeting today, and uh, this has been a really pressure meeting you. Uh, what I take away from uh, today is that um, you kind of reach out to, to all of us. Uh, you spoke about the three uh, dimensions we cannot solve on our own, climate change, pandemics, and terror. I fully agree in what you have said. And as uh, chairman of the Indian uh, European uh, Union delegation, I will do anything I can to strengthen the relationship between the Union and, uh, and India. And uh, I'm looking forward to meeting you and some of your colleague in either Brussels and uh, Delhi. And I wish you all the best of luck in your, in your journey uh, to, to change uh, India uh, together with uh, your Prime Mayor. And I'm uh, looking forward to uh, cooperate with, with you and uh, the government uh, you uh, belong to. So thank you very much for, for attending this. Well, from my part, I, th I thought it was a very interesting debate, Minister. Above all, I see it as a very positive, let's say, the tone which we had for the relationship between EU and India. Um, that's certainly the most important thing which I remember, the willingness for a closer cooperation between the EU and India. And we and the EU have to be fully aware of this. I also take away what Anna said, let's say, this issue of Africa. I mean, this, uh, this is certainly what you said, insufficiently known in Europe, let's say, what you do for Africa. It's a big concern for Europe as well, but what uh, India is doing already in Africa and what you mentioned is extremely important, but also on the other big issues which are on our agenda, like climate change, health cooperation. I mean, it's huge what I think India can do and the figures which you mentioned about the, what you managed to do for your own country, but what you managed to do for the rest of the world is really impressive. Any final words from your side or? Well, thank you. I'm just waiting for the next opportunity to visit Brussels. <laughs> Great. And uh, we thank you on behalf of SEPS for this uh, very interesting webinar. Uh, we hope to see you live in Brussels again. And I hope, let's say, to be able to come to Regina Dialogue and probably to meet you there because I learned a lot from the Regina Dialogues and my colleagues as well. And let me thank also my colleagues at SEPS, Stefania, um, also Xavier for having organized this with us, but also the Embassy of India here in Brussels, your Ambassador Ja, which I met, very interesting person. So we hope to contribute to have this cooperation between the EU and India, and we as a think tank hope to contribute to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. <coughs> Thanks, Anna and Soren. And we will be in touch, Anna. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Minister. Bye-bye. <laughs>